we were living in the Congo, we found a book, and I I, I recommend it, but I but I can't remember enough of the details about it to to feel safe about endorsing it. I don't remember if the language is all perfect or anything. It's a uh, it's a true story of a guy who was uh, I think it was. Anyway, I don't remember what National Alley was, but he decided that he would do something adventurous and difficult, and he would, um, on, a, on a, what he thought was going to be an easy scale, he would retrace the uh, route, the steps, that um, Richard Morton Stanley, was it Richard Stanley? What was Stanley's name? Richard? Henry, Henry Morton Stanley. Uh, took going down the Congo River. And so what he did was he went, he arrived, the book is called Facing the Congo. And there's a really good reason why he calls it that, which I'll get to here in a couple of hours, I think. So he, it's going to be one of those stories. But um, I, I really enjoyed every minute of it because we lived there. <laughs> and I I had my own encounters of facing the Congo, and he, uh, he arrived in the little Congo, it was called Congo Brazzaville, it used to be the French Congo, and then he took a, he took a boat across the river to Kinshasa, the, uh, the capital of the DRC, which is interesting, I've done that thing, they call it a, a canot rapide, you go in a speedboat, and they tend to overload, I mean, they tend to put as many passengers as they can in this little, you know, this little runabout thing that you'd see on the Severn River or something. And if, you know, if you have like five or six or seven people, the water, I mean, the side, what would you call it? The side of the, of the speedboat is here and the water is like here. You know, like don't anybody move or let's hope we don't hit a wave or anything like that. And then who lives in that water? <laughs> And uh, so uh, anyway, so it's, it's a lot of fun. So he comes over and he gets to the Kinshasa side and then it just absolutely, boom, it just swallows him up. And everything is impossible. Everything is difficult. Everything is corrupt. And it's like Bienvenue au Congo. It's just the way it is. And uh, so he, he gets on a ferry and he rides up from Kinshasa, he goes up to Bandaka, and from there he goes up, and it, I'm, I'm drawing the map the wrong way for him, but if you look at the map of the Congo, Kinshasa, the capital's down here, and it goes up the river, and then it goes way across the north part of the country, and then it descends down this way, and goes all the way down to a little bitty stream that crosses the border into Zambia. It's, a, it's one of the longest, this thing is the second, no, it's the longest river in the world. It is the longest river. It just doesn't have the volume that the Amazon does. But by the time it gets down to Kinshasa, it's like uh, miles wide. It's a huge amount of water. And so he took a ferry from Kinshasa up and around and over to what used to be called Stanleyville. Now it's called, um, uh, whatchamacallum? Da, 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 da. Let me enjoy my senior moment here. I don't remember. Anyway, I'll think about it. So uh, what used to be Stanleyville, and he hires a guide and a canoe, and they're going to canoe down the river, at least with the current. They're going to canoe down. It's like 2,000 miles. And he's going to canoe down this river and retrace the steps. This guy's a journalist. He wanted to write a book, and this is going to be the essence of his book. So, I mean, what an adventure. If you're going to choose anything, I mean, you can walk to the North Pole or Antarctica, or you can canoe down the Congo River uh, in the very, very heart of darkness and the heart of Africa, and uh, mosquitoes and malaria and, and dengue fever and Ebola, I mean, everything at your disposal. And, uh, you know, how much can you load up a canoe with food? And they're going to be out there a long time. And, you know, they're going to be bar they're going to be trading with people in, in riverside villages. And, and he's got a whole pocket full of cash that he's kept stashed so that nobody knows he has it, supposedly. And he's going to have to dip into his U.S. dollars every now and then. And I think he even, I, I don't, I'm not sure how, but I think he even smuggled a rifle that he thought he might have to use. And I think he went overboard one time and it was gone. Anyway. It's, it's a horrendous journey, and it get, it's a great read. And again, I don't know if, he's, if it's really like, you know, perfection in the language. 
and he doesn't have any terrible evil escapades that I can remember in this because he's on the river. But it gets so bad. It gets so bad for this guy who's never been in this environment before. Um, his guide gets malaria that's so bad that the guy's dying in the canoe. And um, he actually has to load him onto a, a ferry. They, they, they pass a ferry coming up the river and they transport this guy over there. And now this guy's actually alone. Um, I mean, there's bandits. They've been sleeping on the side of the river. You know, they have to put up a tent and he can't believe these insects that just, I mean, there's zillions of insects. And anyway, so just as bad as you can imagine. And here's the point. It gets so bad that and what he write, wrote in this book, it got so bad that I'm just, I'm in total despair and I've got to get out of this. I've got to get out of this. And how do I get out of this? Keep going. The only thing to do is keep going. I either die here or I die trying or I get through it. And so the title of the book, Facing the Congo, means he wasn't just facing the river. He was facing the environment and ultimately he was facing himself and what he had inside. And he, 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 he went on, but he didn't complete the journey the way he intended to, and he never arrived back in, in Bandaka or Kinshasa with the canoe. He finally found that, I think that same ferry had turned around back at, uh, yeah, you know, what used to be Stanleyville. I can't, I can't remember. Kisangani, that's what it's called. And so he, he finds this ferry coming down the river, and he just, you know, raves his hands, and they pull him up, and I don't know if he had $50 in the last part of his shoe or whatever it was, and he buys a ticket on this ferry, and he makes it home. He makes it to Bandaka. From Bandaka, he gets on a plane, flies to Kinshasa, and whew, beats feet back to Europe and survives. Facing the Congo, it's a thing about pain. It's a thing about despair. It's a thing about how horrible can things get before they get even more horrible, and then how do, you, how do you get out of it? The only answer is you just have to keep going. Talk about a lesson on perseverance. There's one for you. It's a great read. It's a guy, the guy's name is Jeffrey Taylor with an E, T-A-Y-L-E-R. Um, I, I used to jog a lot. I haven't jogged since last August. I, I used to jog regularly, and I did it in Africa for years and years, and I mean, I'm not, you know, obviously Mr. Fit guy, but, uh, you know, it helped me and it was good for my, you know, heart that is already kind of weird. And, and I always, you know, I, when I would jog, I, I always felt, almost always would feel knee pain. And the older I got, the worse the knee pain would be, especially in my left. And I knew, and it was torn up and I tore the ACL before I, I tore the ACL playing football with these knuckleheads before, I mean, several months before I got saved. We were down at uh, the park in, um, on Hilltop, what's it called? Truxton, Truxton Park, playing football with the guys. And I intercepted a pass, as usual, by uh, thrown by, who else? The bishop. And uh, he was always so easy to read. I mean, he, he, you know, you can just tell where he's going to throw the ball, you know. So, you know, he's looking at this guy, and he looks at this guy, and he's looking at this guy, and this guy's over here waving his arm saying, I'm open, but he's looking at this guy. So I go over there to defense, sure, and I catch it, man, come down, ready to cut, yow! And my ACL, my ACL tore my left knee, I'm down on the ground, and I've never, at that point in my life, I had never felt physical pain as intense as that, and so I'm kind of just saying, Wow! And so the great apostolic football players come over, lay hands on me, oh my, to my chagrin. And they're, oh Lord, you know, and, and doing all this stuff and, um, you know, for healing. And, um, you know, and so I'm just saying, oh, come on. You know, I mean, come on. But inside I'm saying, yeah, come on. You know, come on. Pour it on. If you guys got anything, empty it out into this knee. And uh, so it kind of, my knee got warm. I thought that was like a good thing. I answered a prayer and it warmed and it swole up pretty nice. You know, like I, like I had a little wrap on it. And I got up and I prayed for 45 more minutes. I didn't even know it was torn. I mean, I just hurt my, I tweaked my knee. That's all I knew. I hurt my knee and it's torn. But anyway, so I played for 45 more minutes. I'm cutting and juking and jiving, but with a little bit of care and, you know, and so we, uh, I, we didn't have any money in those days. And I, I went to Anne Arundel because I have a hurt knee. We got, I got to be back on the job back in Virginia in those days. 
uh, the next day, and we've only come up here to visit Pat's family and, and for her to go to church up here. And uh, so we go to the emergency room in Anne Arundel, and uh, they x-ray my knee. You know, that makes sense. The X, you know, I think, you know. And so the x-ray looks fine, you know, and uh, nothing, you know, nothing broken. Okay, oh, it's got like $100 or something like that, which wasn't much. It was 1977, and, but it was, it was like a fortune to me. So give them $100. I don't know how, what I was doing with $100. Maybe I just promised them $100. I don't know. Anyway, so then we go back. Next day, I'm down in the ditch doing electrical work. You know, we're building a school down there, and we're running pipe and, and doing all this stuff, and it hurts, and I can't bend it, and it's swollen up, and it stayed like that for a long time. And then we'd come back up, and I played more, played more football, and, you know, I would put a, a wrap on it or something. I played basketball with these guys. and For years and years and years, I just always had a bum left knee. And then it got so bad in Zambia that we had a chance to go to South Africa, and I had a knee doctor, this great guy named Mac Rogan, a Scottish guy in Johannesburg, and he was the knee man for South Africa, as it turns out. But anyway, so I, he goes, he, take, he puts me down on the table, he picks up my left leg, he says, I can tell you right now, your ACL's torn. And I thought, hmm, that explains some things. And uh, he says, yeah, I need to go in there and scope it. And, you know, if I have time, you know, I can, I can repair it. I can reattach it. But you're going to be down and you're going to have rehab and blah, blah, blah. And I can't stay in South Africa. I can't do that. So I said, no, I just, you know, look in there. And, and he gave me a video of the whole thing. It's kind of cool, you know, inside of my knee. Like, well, what is that? You know, is that me? And look at this. And he cuts out this piece of meniscus, puts it in a little bottle. I got to keep that. I don't know what I did with that. I need to dig that some, someplace and bury it, maybe bury it in Africa. Anyway, so this huge piece of cartilage. And so what happened when he got in there, he said, I can see, you know, this was, this was at that point almost not quite 20 years later. And the, the ACL had, had kind of floated over and grew onto the PCL. So it gave me a little bit of stability. Blah, blah, blah. Long story, not about my poor knee, but about the fact that whenever I jogged, I always, almost always felt pain. And I, so what I would do is keep running and the pain would kind of get numb, <laughs> probably because I wasn't doing the right thing. And, uh, and I could finish the jog. And I, you know, and when I was in Botswana, I was doing five miles three times a week and in the heat and the sun of the desert and feeling good and my knee would hurt and then I'd get through it on mile number two and it was fine, the other miles and da 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 blah, blah. And I was always kind of weighing it against my heart health. I mean, what do I want to do? Do I want to just quit jogging for the rest of my life? Because this is keeping, I think it's keeping my ticker going the way I need to. And so I just learned to balance this thing. And and years, years, and years later, now we're back in America, in fact, just a, three or four years ago, and somebody in one of the churches that we were visiting, um, the pastor's wife was having a real problem with one of her knees, and she had tried all these different things, and all these kind of, you know, this and that, and home remedies, and, you know, homeopathic, this and that, and um, I said, Sister... Uh, you know, I don't know what to do, she would say. You know, I, went on, I, you know, I don't think I should, you know. That. And I said, look, sister, here's what you really need to do right now. You need to embrace the pain. She said, what in the world do you mean? I said, you need to make this pain, you need to take ownership of this pain. And you need to sort out what you're going to do with this pain. I mean, you can live with this, or you can have it fixed, or you can do what you want to do. You can pray about it, and if there's no answer coming from God, you just got to embrace this pain and then just let, let, it ha let something happen. Let it, let, it, let it come to full fruition. And so that, that, that phrase, embracing the pain, even though I just kind of used it on the spur of the moment, kind of has become a life lesson for me, and that's what I want to finish up with today is the subject of embracing the pain. There's a scripture that Paul writes to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, and he says this. He says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, those who have died before us. People in the church that have died before us. I don't want you to be ignorant about them. I don't want you to sorrow. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant and that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. And a great subject to, to study also is the biblical understanding or the biblical meaning of what hope is. Because it is not at all like the modern use of the word hope. 
we hope for things uh, in the world. People hope for things that are just beyond any reality. We hope for things as if it's, uh, you know, if it's, it's like we're, 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 we're rubbing the rabbit's foot, you know, for good luck. Well, I hope it's sunny tomorrow. Well, that's not biblical hope. Biblical hope is, is actually an earnest expectation of something that you know shall happen. It's not faith in that you've heard this particular phrase from God about something, but there's a hope that's in you because you know Him and you understand the kingdom of God and you have a hope that based on the principles in the kingdom of God that this should be the outcome of something. This is what I'm hoping. We have a hope. Heaven is our hope. You can say that you've got faith in going to heaven. That's right. But you're actually living with a hope that you'll end up united with Him forever and ever. We have hope that we'll get through certain trials. There's a hope. And Paul tells them, that's the use of this word hope in 1 Thessalonians 4. I don't want you to be worried, brethren, about those that have gone to sleep before. They've died before and left us here on the earth. As though you were going to sorrow and grieve over that. Because we know that there's a certain hope. And it's not like the world hopes. And the sorrow that we should feel is not like the sorrow that people in the world feel. And when we're talking about pain and difficulty and trial and persecution and going without and suffering in the kingdom of God, we're talking about having a hope that the world doesn't even know. That's why they despair. That's why we shouldn't despair. When life comes down crashing on, all, on the top of you like a tree on the top of one's house, there's a hope that just gets you through it. There's an earnest expectation of deliverance one way or the other. I told the, uh, the group last night that, you know, probably all of us have certain phrases or certain what we call mantras that we, you know, that we kind of play for ourselves and our heads and in our spirit. And we say to one another that are close to around us, you know, in certain times. And one of them that, that works for me and has worked for years and years and I know it's a God thing, is that everything will be all right. And sometimes that's all I got. <laughs> sometimes that's all I know. God does little things for me. It probably it may not mean much to others, but He knows me. And so there's certain things that He just does for me that I know and recognize as him saying, everything would be all right. I was absolutely down in the dumps many, many years ago. We were in the United States on deputation. Things were really, really, really bad. Things were really bad. I wasn't in despair, but I was headed that way. And it was my birthday, and I'm walking somewhere in a parking lot and I look down, and there's a penny on the ground. And I don't pass up pennies. And I know it's not worth it. I know that the labor that you put out in lifting up the penny costs you more than a penny. I know that time is money. But I'm not that important. So I pick them up, and I look at them. And I look at, I always look at the date as if it's something special. And I picked it, and I don't care if it was heads up or down. I don't care about the luck and all that stuff. But I reach down and I pick up the penny on my birthday, and it's a 1952 penny, the year I was born. And as simple and goofy as that sounds, that was like, to me, that was like God saying happy birthday. That's pretty cool. You know, those coincidences that uh, people in the world can't understand, sometimes we get an understanding of them. Worst day. It was worse than that. I'm in Zambia. All things are crashing around and who knows. I can't remember, if, you know, which preacher was backsliding or, you know, what group was rising up in rebellion against the leadership of the church. Who knows what I was dealing with. And I'm driving home from the Bible college 
place in Zambia and I'm headed home and I'm just, I mean, I'm down in the dumps. I mean, how bad can this get? And um, the mini buses over there, that you know, these little van size, small van size thing, instead of the big buses, they had, a lot, they had thousands of what they call mini buses. And a lot of them had slogans written on them, like and one popular slogan that you saw quite often was, kill them all and let God sort them out. You know, and that's actually gone through my mind a few times. You know. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm, here I am, you know, struggling in it with something. And I get up to a roundabout, have to slow down. And this guy comes in, you know, and cuts in front of me like the minibus driver do. And on the back of his, it says, everything will be all right. Wow. I felt better already. I mean, on and on and on and on. I wouldn't have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those that have died, that you sorrow not like others which have no hope. But here's the deal. Sorrow and grief are genuine human emotions. And you can't just ignore them. And you can't deny them like they aren't happening. You can't do that. They've got to be felt to the same end as those without hope, except with hope. You need to feel them, and you need to embrace them, and you need to learn from those things. In 2 Corinthians 7, Paul points out the difference in perspective on things like this, and when he says that godly sorrow, I love this verse, godly sorrow works repentance. Godly sorrow produces repentance. Godly sorrow. Sorrow that one has received from the hand of God. Sorrow that one has received from the hand of God. It's like God just digs into his bag of stuff and hands you sorrow. Here, have a dose of this. And godly sorrow produces repentance. And the interesting thing about this verse is the way that he, he says it, the way that this, this succession is drawn out. He says, Godly sorrow produces or works repentance unto salvation, which is not to be repented of. God, what a, what a writer. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, which is not to be repented of. You've got to sometimes just embrace the sorrow and embrace the pain and learn the lesson and be human and rely on God and hope to the end, not like those that have no hope in the world. Sometimes you've got to get in the dark room and just sit there with your sorrow and your grief and your loss and your pain and just work it out between you and God. Sometimes you've got to do that with others. You've got to let them have that space. You can go and comfort them, but you can't take their sorrow away from them. You go, don't try to do that. Don't tell them how much worse you felt when you went through the same thing. Let them go through this and be there. Put a hand on them and let them know that you're praying for them. Let them know that you care. And by doing that, sometimes all you're doing is really letting them, reminding them that God cares more about this than you know. And there's a hope. Paul finished that verse by saying, but the sorrow of the world, the sorrow of the world doesn't work repentance. It works death. It kills people. It destroys them. It takes out any... Any hope involved, it takes out any reality of getting better through this crisis and it just makes them worse. It makes them bitter instead of better. It makes, them, it makes them regret the experience. It makes them get mad at God and how can God do all these bad things in this world when he's supposed to be so good? Well, he's doing something inside people that will let him do it. Not all pain that comes into our lives is a curse. It's not that we're being cursed. We're not sick because we, not necessarily because we did something bad. Things just happen to people. We're human and we're frail and we're fragile more than we, than, than we make out sometimes. And pain just happens and it's not always a curse. And so sometimes, you know, 
It's not that we've got to repent about something grievous in order to end the curse, but rather it's just always is trying to connect us more closely with the compassion of a great Savior. Remember this. The word repentance, metanoia in the Greek, simply means a change of mind. What God does sometime through godly sorrow is simply try to change our minds. Isn't that awesome? It's as if he says, it's as if he says, pick up that penny. And have a happy birthday. And look at it the way I look at it. Isaiah 53 and 3. Jesus, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Sorrows, literally in the Hebrew, pain, both physical and mental. He was a man of pain, both physically and mentally. The writer of Hebrews glosses over it almost and by saying that he was tempted in all points like as we yet without sin. And I mean, he just glosses, just speeds right through Jesus' life in saying that. But think of how profound that really is. He was tempted in all points. Wait a minute, what do you mean? Well, he was a man of pain, both physically and mentally. He was acquainted with grief. Is what he knew. Grief, literally, in the Hebrew, sickness, disease, or any kind of affliction. That's what Jesus knew. Sorrow and grief were his constant companions. Why? Because he felt the pain of others as if it was his own. He looked out on the multitude and saw them like sheep without a shepherd. They're coming down to Jerusalem with his disciples, and he's on the road that leads them from Galilee down to Jericho and then going west to Jerusalem but on the way as he as he's coming down into Jericho he comes across Bartimaeus crying on the side of the road Jesus have mercy on me they the disciples try to quiet him he cries out longer and Jesus simply says bring him to me because he knew he'd be there He had an appointment with Bartimaeus. And not only did he have an appointment with Bartimaeus, but right after that, when he goes into Jericho, he has another appointment that day with a man named Zacchaeus. Everything's perfectly in order in his life. He's given to the will of God. This is why he goes into the mountain apart to pray all the time. Because he's going to do the will of his Father. He's going to do what he's called to do at any cost. He's going to feel every bit of pain and sorrow of everybody that he comes across because he's God. Because he's the heavenly father robed in flesh. Heavenly father. Who every day looks at a world full of people suffering and won't even call on his name. And he is love. And how does that feel? No wonder he was a man of Sorrow and acquainted with grief. He knows everything about everybody. He knows you. He knows your last sorrow and he knows your next pain. And sometimes when we embrace the pain, then we get to know him more than ever before. 
I'll tell you something right now. I'll tell you something right now. There's not truer words ever spoken than, than these. Some of the sweetest people I've ever known are the ones most bruised. Some of the most arrogant, unfeeling, and callous people I've ever known are the ones who have been seemingly untouched in life. They just don't know. And sometimes the biggest change that I've ever seen in people has happened in people who were walking that easy way and now suddenly they've just been loaded on in their life with grief and sorrow and loss and pain. And now they get sweeter. If they don't get bitter, then they get sweeter. And you can see them change. And now they have compassion. And now they're not self-righteously declaring healing for everybody who's sick and saying that if you just get your life right, then God would deliver you from that and everything will be okay. They're not saying that at all. That's what they used to say because that was their mantra. They thought that worked for them until it all came crashing down and they really had to suffer like everybody else suffers. And now they just have a comforting word and say, it's all right, it'll be okay. And I'm here for you like God is here for you. It can change everything in a leader's life. It can take somebody who's not a leader and make him one of the greatest leaders in the world. When you embrace the pain. Sorrow and grief. His constant companions because he felt the pain of ours. How does it touch Jesus when he sees the hurt and the damage and the loss and the pain in those people that he created? In the very ones that he wants to redeem. In those that are destined for blessed and eternal fulfillment. How does it touch him when we err? How does it touch him when we suffer? Well, we would do well to remember the blood and the water that came pouring out of the side of the broken Savior on the cross. Because literally his heart had broken. Literally his heart had broken. I remember hearing that preached by somebody a long time ago. And I remember thinking, is that really true? Or is that just some clever thing that preachers can say? That his heart actually ruptured and actually can, there can be, he can be sweating great drops of blood. And I looked it up and sure enough, physiologically, it's accurate. It's possible to sweat blood under that kind of pressure and torment. And when they open him up, what do they find pouring out of his side? Blood and water. And I think all the time of how Eve was created by God after he made man. And he said, it's not good that man should be alone because man should love. Man should be loved. It should be a picture of me and my church ultimately in the future. This marriage of Adam and Eve should be exactly what I want the church relationship with me to be. And so he, he causes Adam to sleep just the same way that Jesus died. Adam goes to sleep. And as he slept, he opened his side and took out a rib through his side. And from that rib, he built his bride. It's a perfect image of the building of the church by God. He's going to cause the last Adam to go to sleep in death. And then from that side, bring forth a, a wife that's perfect for him. And how did she come to be? She came through his side. And from that same side flowed blood and water. And if you want to be part of the church, you've got to come through the blood and the water. And there's no other plan of salvation. For us, real faith does not lie in escaping or evading the trial or the affliction. That's not real faith. That's just fairy tale stuff. That's popular preaching that makes people's ears stop itching. Real faith is not ever always escaping. It's not always evading the trial or the affliction or the pain. But in actual fact, it's the, it's, the, it's the life that perseveres in the middle of it. While we steadfastly keep looking at Jesus, who amazingly is called in Hebrews 12 and verse 2, the author and the finisher of our faith. You want to help me read again? Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing that we're compassed about by such a great cloud of witnesses, after the famous chapter 11, 
Then we get the wherefore in chapter 12. All these great people that persevered. I mean, you name me somebody in that list of Hebrews 11 that had the easy way all the time. There's not one. There's not one. So having all this cloud of witnesses, read. Loud. Wherefore seeing, we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Well, everywhere you look, everywhere you look in the Word of God, and when you look around at the great people of God that you've known that have come and gone and through history, what do you see? A great cloud of witnesses. They persevered. So seeing that cloud every day, what happened? And run with patience. And run with patience. The race. The race that is set before. And how do you run? Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. The, author. the originator and the completer of our faith. Who for the joy that was Hang on. He began and he will finish our faith. He started your faith and he will complete your faith if you give him a chance. If you run the race by looking unto him, the author and the finisher, the originator and the fulfiller of your faith, who for the joy set before him, how did he run his race? There was a joy that was set before him. When Jesus looked, What did he see? He saw all the pain. He saw all the sorrow. He saw all the grief. He saw all the suffering. And he also saw something else. He saw a joy that was set before him, which was what? Your salvation. Every single day, a man of sorrow is an acquaintance every day. Day it looks out on a sea of faces that people that are suffering and they don't some of them don't even know how they're grievously suffering and they're they're hopelessly lost it seems, but for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and therefore he's set down at the right hand of the throne of the Father forever and ever. That's how you live. That's real faith. But more often than not, for a lot of people, all we do is run away from the pain as much as we can. We do everything we can to avoid the pain. That's, that's just humanity. We hire preachers to preach to us about how we can escape the pain. We pay them good money to tell us that because we like it. It's the better way. But it's not, it's not running the race. It's not enduring the cross. It's not looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We experience pain and rejection by other people, by personal loss, by feeling abjection, and there was just nothing we can do. It's hopeless. We feel it in physical pain and disability, diminution of what we expect regarding the quality of life. It's just not, this isn't the way it was supposed to be. The John the Baptist syndrome. Locked up after living a righteous life. And he sends the message to Jesus. Are you really the one? Is this the way it's supposed to work? Is this the culmination of this calling of mine? I lived in the desert all of my young life. I ate bugs. I lived with wild skins wrapped around me. I lived apart from people. I couldn't even recognize Jesus as my cousin when I came back into town until I was shown him by God. That's how I didn't even go to the family reunions all those 30 years. And this is how it ends. I mean, I know I said that he must increase and I must decrease, but is this the way it's supposed to end? And then 
The message is cruel. The message is almost cruel in its content. Well, go and tell John that the lame walk and the blind see and the deaf hear and the dead are raised back to life again. That's not what John wants to hear at all. And then he says this, And also tell John that blessed is he that's not offended in me. Blessed is the one that's not offended in the way and the path that I've chosen for them. And if they'll just stick with me and hold my hand, I'll get them down this road. Running away, manifest, running away from pain manifests itself in denial. Which carries with it its own kind of private guilt attached to it. Because we know that, you know, this thing that I'm going through shouldn't be happening to a Christian. If I was, I guess if I was living right, this wouldn't have happened. I, you know, so let me just act like it's not happening. I, I don't want people to, you know, think the wrong thing. Denial. It's not happening, but it is. And you feel the guilt. Why am I going through this? What did I do? Let me just ignore this. Let me get past this. Running away manifests itself in seeking a quick and easy deliverance. All with good intentions and fervent prayer. Supposedly believing towards a miracle working God. But the question is, just what kind of miracle is really needed? What's the miracle that God's really wanting to make? Maybe it's on the other side of persevering. This running away manifests itself in mixing up spiritual gifts of healing and deliverance and turning it into a recipe of untouchable protection. Or some kind of spiritual invincibility. Well, I just said in Jesus' name, and it lifted up the car, and I went sailing over the tractor trailer that should have crushed me. What a wonderful story. And the whole house will be on their feet as you tell about how God kept you from pain and suffering and loss and disability. Running away manifests itself in finding the affirmation and the opinions of our peers rather than from looking at a divine perspective of godly living. In other words, rather than looking unto Jesus, what we end up doing is seeking affirmation from other people by looking good and by hiding the pain and disguising our weakness and by saying and doing what looks to be right and telling everybody all the time that we're okay, we'll get through this. While all the time we stay in pain and sorrow and grief and conflict, So embracing the pain means simply coming to terms with real issues of life and seeking the answers to questions like this. How does this pain and sorrow carry me further in God's plan and grace? That's embracing the pain. How does this make me better? How does this reveal to me more of the principles of God's kingdom? How is this pain actually making me grow and building me stronger than I ever was? How does this pain fit into and contribute to my walk with God? How, what, what is it, how does it play its part in the bigger picture? Or simply put, what exactly am I supposed to learn here? The book of Philippians chapter number 4. Philippians chapter number 4. Cry, baby. Philippians has got to be one of Paul's favorite letters because it has to be one of Paul's favorite churches. I mean, it's, it's, it's just encouraging to read the book because they're just good people. <laughs> they're, I mean, they just love God and they love Paul and And they're primarily doing the right thing. And it's not full of rebukes or corrections. It's full of encouragements. It's just a positive thing to read and and to contemplate. He really appreciates their faith and their walk with God. Earlier in the the book, as early in chapter 1, almost in the introduction, he, he tries to make them feel better rather than bad about his suffering. He's writing this from Rome. 
He's writing this not long before he's going to be killed. He's going to be martyred for the cause of Christ. This is one of his final letters, and, and he's writing to them, and he's telling them, don't be sad for me. Don't be, don't be discouraged because of my imprisonment. This is exactly where I should be. This is just part and parcel of what God had to do through me. And my sorrows and my discomforts here work to your comfort there. Divine perspective. I wonder, in, was it Acts 14 where he's, he's stoned at the village called Lystra? And it sounds like he's, left, he sounds like he's, he sounds like he's put to death and left at least to die on the road. And then the, his, his, his helpers pray for him and God restores him. He writes later on that he was caught up to the third heaven in one experience. And I wonder if it was on that road to Lystra where God took him for a minute and then put him back, put life back in his body. And Paul said that he saw things which are unlawful to utter. You know what that tells me? It tells me about a principle in the kingdom of God, and that is that nobody knows what heaven exactly is. That nobody knows how, how wonderful it is. There's no way to describe it. It is unlawful to try to put it into words. Go to the Christian bookstore. Look on YouTube at all the maniacs that have written books and, and talking, and making money of other experiences of, being, of dying and going to heaven and coming back and describing for everybody how wonderful it was. What a bunch of rubbish. Absolute lies. Paul was taken up to the third heaven and he returns and he says, I saw things that I am not allowed to even speak of because what he really is saying is, I couldn't describe them if I tried. I think often of that commandment of the original, the ones we call the original Ten Commandments where it says, Thou shalt make no graven image. Why? Because in the very moment that you start to carve the wood or chip on the stone or erect some great monument, the very minute you start and pledge yourself to do it, you've already made God too small. The minute you start writing in your book about your visit to heaven, and if you're doing it right now, then hear this as a word of God. Don't write the book because it's wrong. The minute you try to describe heaven, you're already minimizing how great it is. We have no concept. Don't tell me about the streets of gold. Because gold will have absolutely no meaning whatsoever in heaven. None. So Paul says in chapter number 4, verse number 1. Follow this build up, if you will. This is a wonderful epistle. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown... Paul's joy and crown was in looking and thinking and praying about the people that he had managed to reach by the grace of God. For you small group leaders and small group participants, please, please look at the opportunity and the privilege as well as the challenge of building that small group with that same kind of spirit. Look at your small group as something beloved and longed for. Your joy and your crown as people grow in the grace of God. It's not just something to do on Wednesday night or Sunday afternoon or wherever you have it. No, it's a joy and a crown. He says, stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Yodius and Sintichi. Evidently two, la two ladies and possibly two leaders as well in the Philippian work. But I beseech them that they be of the same mind in the Lord. I don't know what was causing the dispute or the disagreement, but he just simply wants them to be at peace and be who they are. Verse 3, And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with my other fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice, here's one you know, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, Rejoice. And let your moderation be known unto all men, because the Lord is at hand. And then this verse, be careful for nothing. Be anxious about nothing. Don't let your life become full of anxiety over anything. 
because there's a bigger picture if you'll just look. There's a hope. There's something that makes us different. We are different. Be careful for nothing. But instead of becoming anxious about these things that trouble so many people in the world, in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Simply embrace the pain and talk to God about it. And then the real verse. I feel like something's crawling on my head. If it is, ignore it. Okay. And I want, I, want you, I want you to tell me what you think verse 7 means. You can look at it in the Greek and it says the same thing. So you're not going to get any insight there. And the peace of God... And the peace of God, which passeth understand, all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And the peace of God, let's keep it simple. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. What does that mean? There's two ways of looking at this. The peace of God is so magnanimous in nature that it's beyond human understanding. That seems to be a popular way, I think, of interpreting that verse, isn't it? It's a piece of God which goes beyond understanding. I mean, we, we look at the peace of God and it's so great that we can't even understand how it could be so great. It's beyond our imagination. It's like that verse in... Ephesians 3, now unto him that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think, according to the power which worketh in us. So here's a piece of God which is beyond all understanding. But here's the other way. Here's the way that really pricks my heart on this verse. And the peace of God, the peace of God which goes beyond understanding. Understanding what? understanding the circumstance that we find ourselves in. Because there are some people, there's a lot of people, whose only peace rests in understanding the situation. I've got to know how this is going to work out. And if I don't, then I'm anxious, I'm unsettled. But if I can just see my way through this, if I can see the other side, then I can have peace about this. But the peace of God, the peace of God goes beyond even the times where we can't see the other side. I don't know how I'm going to come through this. I don't know. But I find peace. Because I've got a hope that never disappoints. So I don't know, Paul, I'll ask you when I get there, or maybe you just meant a double entendre from the word go. I don't know. And the Greek doesn't make it any clearer for me. But I like the second one. Because I'll tell you right now, I'm not one of those guys that sees through everything all the time. And I'm one of those guys that have felt the pangs of desperation more than once. But I haven't run away either. And every time I've stayed and persevered, it just gets me into another one. Where I know I can stay and persevere. And it'll be all right. And even if it's just a penny with my birth year on it, it's enough to say, yeah, you're thinking right. I know who you are and you know who I am. Paul writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, and he says, For he, that's God, made him, that's Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Sounds great, but it was a terrible burden and price to pay. 
If we had kept reading in Hebrews chapter 12, we would come down to verse 4 where he tells the Hebrew believers that they hadn't endured unto the shedding of blood quite yet. If you think it's bad, you haven't climbed on the cross completely yet because it can be worse. There's the passage in Romans chapter number 5 that has meant very, very, very much to me through the years. It's another just wonderful analytical exposition of how things work in the kingdom of God. Therefore, in verse 1 he says, Paul says, being justified by faith, because of that we have peace with God. I know who I am. I know where I stand. I know where I belong. And I have peace about that. And I have it. I have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom also we have access by faith into the grace wherein we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so. And then this amazing passage. We glory in tribulations also. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance produces experience. I got through that. By the grace of God. And I know I can get through this by the grace of God. Even if I don't understand the outcome. Not yet. I'm going to get through it. And everything's going to be all right. Patience produces experience. And experience produces hope. And hope never disappoints us. I say again that it is absolutely my sincere pleasure and privilege to be able to talk to a group of a group of brothers and sisters like you i don't take it lightly i don't consider it lightly it's a great it's a great great privilege of which i am not worthy and uh, i have i have nothing to share except the words of god and a few experiences that he has brought about in my life so that uh, just enough so that i can say Even without seeing through to the other side, I know that everything's going to be all right. Would you stand? Do you love God more than anything? Do you love Him more than anything? Do you love Him more than anything? Well, I'm telling you right now, some way, somehow, sometime, someplace, everything's going to be all right. And he'll never disappoint you. Praise God. If you want to be a leader, there's not a better better place for it to happen than right here. There's not a better place. My formative years were here. I left here at age 31 to explore the great vastness of the African revival, and God never let us down. But I, 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 the six years I was here, I can tell you story after story about growing in grace and the knowledge of God. And beyond that, having an opportunity where gifts Giftings and callings and talents could be exercised to the nth degree because there was, a, there was a visionary at the helm of this particular ship and it was a privilege to be on the, on the boat with him. And the church is still sailing free and strong here at Antioch. So you can be exactly what God wants you to be and you're in the right place for it to happen. Don't look too far in the future. Don't worry too much about in the future. Look at what God wants to do with you and through you now. For those of you that this is your first taste of leadership development, just by coming to this introductory session, then welcome. We welcome you with open arms. Join the team. Learn the handshake. Learn the secret language of a revival speaking leadership. And join the squad and see what happens. Because with us and through us and because of His power and His anointing, God can do anything in this church anything we have yet to to see what it's going to be but it's going to be all right and he's going to use people like you and me let's pray why don't you just pray with somebody while you pray
Just find somebody to pray with and pray with them. Hallelujah. And declare your love for God as part of the body of Christ. Oh God, without you we can do nothing, Jesus. And yet with you we're more than conquerors because you gave yourself for us. Help us give ourselves, Lord God, to your work. Move in us and through us, Lord. Shine in our hearts, God, and shine out from our hearts and touch other people. Use us, God, in leadership. Use us in ministry. Pour your spirit out, God, on this congregation. Oh, God, help people answer the call and become the chosen and faithful, Lord, that we read about in the beginning this morning. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Lord God. Oh, Jesus. There's none like you in all the earth, God. Make us who you want us to be, Lord. God, strengthen us, encourage us, Lord. Help us embrace the pain and suffering, Lord, of a dying world and understand how grieving and sorrow in our own lives is only there to make us better and more certain, God, of your outcome, Lord, and your choice and destiny. In the name of Jesus, oh God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Seigneur Jésus, sans toi je ne peux rien faire. Mais à cause de ton de la, la, la salut que, que tu m'as donné, je suis là pour toi, Jésus. J'existe pour toi et ton royaume dans ce monde. Au nom de Jésus. Au nom de Jésus. Au nom de Jésus. Alléluia. Seigneur Jésus, et il n'y a que toi, Jésus, mon Sauveur. Le fait que tu m'aimes, c'est, c'est au-delà de mon imagination. Je ne peux pas comprendre l'amour qui vient de toi et ton trône. Ô oh, Jésus, je prie pour les Africains, oh, Jésus, tous les Congolais, tous les Congolais qui sont vraiment perdus et dans un pays perdu. Mais il y a espérance selon ton esprit et tes promesses, Jésus. Touche les, les, les fidèles là-bas. Touche les fidèles avec une présence spirituelle et magnifique qui vient de toi. Au nom de Jésus, au nom de tout ce que tu es et ce que tu veux faire dans nos vies, au nom de Jésus-Christ. Oh God, thank you for the pain, Lord, and thank you for the feeling of loss from time to time. Thank you. If it helps us grow more and know more about your great sacrifice, then so be it, Lord. But help us learn from you. Help us look unto you, the one who started and the one who will finish our faith. Finish our journey, Lord God, in glory. Finish our journey, Lord, according to your promises. God, finish our journey, Lord, in this congregation as we're working in our hands or on the plow, God, never looking back, but always looking unto you who endured the cross. I started off last night by telling the deacons and deaconesses that before people in the, new, in the book of Acts were called Christians, they were known as the people that called upon the name of the Lord. They called upon the name of the Lord. They knew what the name meant. They knew that there was a name above every other name. They knew that as they went down in that river in the name of Jesus, that they were being plunged into a water of separation. 
a water that separated them from the old life, and a water and a, and, a, and a life that was renewed by the power of His Spirit and their dedication to do the will of God because that's what the name meant for them. The name embodied everything that God is and all that He wanted to do. And they were pledging themselves to live a life according to the name of and in the name of Jesus. And when they called on that name, that's what they meant. Lord, behold their threatenings, they prayed in Acts chapter 4, when they told them to stop teaching and preaching what? In that name. Stop calling on that name. You have no authority to call upon that name. We haven't sanctioned that name. Stop doing it. Well, we ought to obey God rather than men, Simon Peter told them. And they kept calling on the name. Antioch, let's call. Let's call upon the name of the Lord like never before. If we can really bind and loose, and don't go crazy over that, understand what it means. But if we can really do it, then let's loose the will of God in our hearts. Anything you ask God, let us answer the call faithfully in the name of Jesus.